Hello, it's Scott Manley here, and Brian May has been having an interesting week, probably becoming the first person to appear at a NASA press conference and on stage at the Golden Globes in the same week, even if technically it wasn't the same year. But regardless, obviously Brian's a bit of a hero of mine because, uh, well, you know, he does actually have a PhD in astronomy. Uh, unlike many other rock stars who have honorary degrees for their fantastic contributions to popular culture, uh, Brian actually did the work back when he was with Queen in the early days. In fact, Queen was one of the most educated bands in history, I believe. You know, Freddie Mercury had a degree in art and design, uh, John Deacon, electronics, and Roger Taylor studied biology. Brian May and not only got his degree in astronomy and physics, but then went on to do a PhD. And then 30 years later, in 2007, he went back to complete his PhD because, you know, while he had done a lot of academic work in the early 70s, he kind of got distracted by this whole rock band thing and disappeared. And you know, for that reason, I'm kind of interested in his career. But yeah, uh, many people wonder, well, what was he actually studying? What was his thesis in? And this is what I want to cover here. Brian's thesis is titled A Survey of Radial Velocities in the Zodiacal Dust Cloud. And well, what he's talking about with the zodiacal dust cloud is a cloud of dust that appears to follow the zodiac in the sky. And that is the series of constellations that lies along the ecliptic. That is the uh, line that the Earth's orbit moves through. Um, so this has been known for you know, thousands of years probably. There are mentions, likely mentions, in pre, uh, very, very old documents of, of this light. It was known back then as the zodiacal light. It was first really studied by Cassini. The zodiacal light is, is something, if you're in a dark place, say close to the equator, after the sunset, after the glow of sunset disappears, there remains a light that extends up into the sky, rather like a steep pyramid. And uh, you know, this is a diffuse light that can actually be brighter than the uh, Milky Way. Similarly, when uh, the sun rises, long before the sun rises, this starts to become evident. Later, it was also noticed there's another patch of bright light which is exactly opposite the Earth, and this is called the Gegenschein. Now, of course, there was much debate as to what this was, but it, uh, it was finally discovered when somebody took a spectra of it that uh, the spectra exactly matched that of the Sun. Therefore, this was light uh, reflecting off of solid objects rather than light that was, say, being scattered by gas or a plasma, which would have had its uh, spectra changed significantly. So the reason that it was dust cloud, and of course, by the time Brian May gets around to looking at this, this is, uh, of course, in the late 60s, early 70s, it's understood that there is a set of dust near the Earth. It's still not sure whether this dust is close to the Earth, it's a ring around the Earth, There's still whether it perhaps uh, has more structure than that. They're not even sure where the dust comes from. Um, so, you know, the dust could come from comets, it could come from asteroids colliding with each other, it could come from uh, interplanetary or in even interstellar sources. And Brian's idea is to look at the spectra of this and look specifically at the velocities of the particles to get an idea of what the origin of this stuff might be and whether it's, say, is living near the Earth or is scattered throughout the entire solar system. So yeah, Brian was hoping to constrain these models by measuring the radial velocities of the particles. And the way he wanted to measure the radial velocities was using spectroscopy. So the idea being is that the, the radial velocity is the distance towards or away from the observer. And if they are emitting light, then the radial velocity will Doppler shift the light. So if he could, could identify certain features in the spectra, say absorption or emission lines, then these would be shifted, red shifted or blue shifted, depending upon whether they were moving towards the observer or away from the observer. Now, it isn't simply a case of pointing at a grain of dust and getting its spectra, because of course, you're getting a whole mix of different dust as, a, as you shine through or you look through it. And depending upon your model, you will get different chunks of the, uh, the, the dust cloud moving at different speeds. So your model has to account for not just a shift in the line, but a shift in the shape of the line, a spread of the uh, spectral lines.
So to measure these spectra, he had a device called a fabry perot interferometer. So an interferometer is something that interferes light. And the idea is that when you have two different waves interacting, if the peaks of the waves line up, then the light will get brighter. If the peaks line up with the troughs, then they will cancel each other out. So a fabry perot interferometer takes the light and it bounces it back and forth between two glass plates. And as the lights bounce back and forth, they travel slightly different distances. And some of the light then comes out the other end. And if every reflection is exactly the same number of wavelengths, then you will get a strong signal. So you're able to sample a very, very small part of the spectrum by adjusting the amount of distance the light travels. But actually, for this particular one, it didn't adjust the distance of the plates. What instead they did was they changed the refractive index of the space of the material in between the plates. And they did this by adding in nitrogen and changing the pressure. They could go all the way up to six atmospheres of nitrogen, and that would give a different refractive index, and therefore the light would travel a slightly different amount of uh, wavelengths. So we could scan this across, and the, I believe the range that was available was something like 10 angstroms. An angstrom is one-tenth of a nanometer. That's 10 to the minus 10 uh, meters. So it's convenient and it's a commonly used measurement. A big part of his work was specifically improving this device, you know, removing uh, redundant optical surfaces, you know, redesigning the beam splitter and uh, actually constructing a whole new case for it. Also, the entire control, timing and sampling electronics, those were all new ones that he built and designed himself. I mean, I guess those guitar making skills were kind of useful when you're building high precision instruments of a different variety. Anyway, you can look at his thesis and find out the exact details of what he did. But once they had the instrument, they wanted to, of course, use it places. So they took it to an observing site in the Italian Alps and were pretty much stymied by snow and bad weather. They were unable to get anything useful and ended up you know, digging the device out of six feet of snow so they could actually take it to a new location. They got an uh, offer to set up an observing site in, uh, in Tenerife. And this obviously was a whole lot better. They built a hut there that was specifically designed for it. This included a space for the instrument, a space for them to like hang out and have cups of tea while the uh, work was being done, and a device called a coleostat. Now, a coleostat is essentially a mirror or a series of mirrors with the mirror can be adjusted so that it will track a specific part of the sky. So they would, you know, track a one degree patch of the sky and then collect light on it. And they would then sample the spectra at different wavelengths. So I believe what they did was they would pressurize the, um, the interferometer up to six atmospheres and then they would slowly bleed out the, the nitrogen until they reached, you know, ambient atmospheric pressure. And that way they would cover the entire spectrum. Each patch of sky for each sample point would take about 50 seconds. So they would take several minutes to sample the, the sky. And of course, they're looking at a fairly large patch of the sky. So they would have to move this thing around and uh, you know, sample all the way out to get as much data as they as possible. During this, they found a few interesting things initially. Uh, they found emission lines for magnesium in the, the zodiacal light, which was not something that had been expected, and they'd, they published a paper on this. But um, for the radial velocity measurements that they were looking at, they were using a wavelength of 5,183.6 angstroms, which is a magnesium absorption line. Interestingly, by the way, many sources say that Brian was doing his PhD on infrared astronomy because he was working with the infrared astronomy department. They were very interested in you know, dust clouds and things like that. But the wavelength he was actually working in is well inside the visible spectra. So anyway, he spent a couple of campaigns collecting a bunch of data and then had to analyze it. And you know, when you get a lot of a data, what do you do? You analyze it on a computer. And back then, Imperial College had a pretty badass computer called the Atlas, which was actually badass for the 1960s and was starting to show its age. So it was a time sharing system where you would write your code and submit it on punch cards. And then it would then maybe come back and you know find out that it actually crashed and didn't do anything useful. 
<laughs> but uh, yeah, you know, you can actually see the code that was written inside uh, the appendices. It's nice to see it on the old green lined fan fold paper there. It's not so nice reading Fortran because, hey, I was forced to do that at some point, but I, I much prefer C these days. But yeah, he found after copious analysis, line fitting and models, that the radial velocities of the zodiacal light were consistent with a flat dust cloud orbiting the sun in the same direction as the Earth. That meant that it wasn't a, um, there wasn't anything going retrograde, so therefore this probably wasn't uh, being fed by comets, because comets coming in on long period orbits will come in on retrograde orbits just as often as they come in on prograde orbits. So it most likely came from a source like the asteroid belt. Um, there was also some evidence of a background interstellar component, which uh, he remarks upon saying that he really wished he'd followed up on that because it wasn't until much later that this was actually identified in uh, space probes like Ulysses, which observed that once it got far enough out that uh, the dust impact started coming from another direction and therefore implied that there was interstellar dust coming in and flowing through the solar system. And that small piece of science from the Ulysses spacecraft obviously wasn't the only stuff that was done on solar system dust. But you're considering that he stopped working on, his, on this in 1974 when Queen took off and more or less didn't touch it until uh, about 2004, 30 years later, there was a surprisingly small amount of ad additional work done in there. And that was perhaps fortuitous because if you know, the, the field had changed significantly, he might not have been able to take his 1974 work and just you know, repackage it for modern audiences. I mean, there is some stuff that happened in the zodiacal light. It, most notably, IRAS, the Infrared Observatory Astronomical we have Satellite, uh, it, it discovered that there was structure in the disk. There were several overlapping disks with different inclinations. And many of these actually lined up with well-known asteroid families. Asteroid families are where you've got a collection of asteroids which cluster around very similar orbits, similar inclinations and uh, things like that. And they're the result of collisions that break up large objects and create a cascade of smaller objects in roughly similar orbits. Now that presumably produces a lot of dust, but it's also, I would imagine, that since you've got a lot of objects in very similar orbits, that they are going to keep on bumping each other and produce a steady supply of dust. Because this dust is not really, really that long lived. The dust actually will follow regular orbits and will be affected by all the various planets and the gravitational forces and resonances, but they're also, it's also strongly affected by the light of the sun. Now, the light of the sun is mostly pushing it outwards. And you can imagine for very, very, very tiny dust grains that the radiation pressure just pushes it straight off into interstellar space. But there's a secondary effect which affects all dust grains, and it's probably more important because it affects everything. It's called pointing Robertson drag. Now, pointing Robertson drag is when you've got the object, the dust particle moving around the sun, the light is going straight out to the particle, right? So the particle's moving in a circle. But when it hits the particle, well, the particle's moving this way a bit. And in the reference frame of this particle, it actually looks like the light is coming slightly head on to it. And that very slight head on light, that pushes it backwards and slows it down. So dust in the inner solar system is just being slowly braked by the solar radiation and will eventually spiral down into the sun. Dust can have lifetimes of uh, you know 10,000 to a million years depending upon its size. So the dust that we see near the Earth has to be being continuously refreshed and it's coming from the asteroid belt. So Brian's final remarks in his thesis show artists' impressions of how the understanding of the zodiacal dust has changed over time. And then he adds on at the end that he was, in fact, the artist. It's another thesis that would change the course of science. I mean, most doctoral theses aren't the crowning work of someone's academic career, but it was a solid bit of science. And you know, he did drive the whole thing from modifying the hardware, doing the observing, 
processing the results and then fitting it into the models. And that shows that this is more than just an honorary degree that, you know, people get from colleges for being culturally relevant. And, you know, Brian May isn't the only musician to have completed a doctorate. Uh, just off the top of my head, there's Dan Snaith, who's known under the stage name of Manitoba or Caribou. He does a lot of like electronic music that I really like. And he had a, he's got a doctorate in mathematics, also from Imperial College London. There's Greg Gaffin, founder of Bad Religion. He has a PhD in uh, zoology. And more recently, we've got Dexter Holland, from, uh, who's the founder of The Offspring, you know, best known for Pretty Fly for a White Guy. Uh, he's less well known for his doctorate in molecular biology. But ultimately, Brian May is my biggest hero. I mean, I've been a fan of Queen for as long as I can remember. In fact, I think one of the earliest memories I have is seeing Bohemian Rhapsody video being played on a TV. And obviously, I was really young at the time and didn't understand the meaning behind all those lyrics. And truthfully, to this day, I don't understand the meaning behind all of those lyrics. But yeah, I did get into astronomy and I studied uh, your objects in the inner solar system, small minor planets. And guess what? That's pretty much uh, what Brian was looking at as well. And I too, well, uh, yeah, I had, I quit my you know thesis, never submitted it because I had a great opportunity to come out to California to work in Silicon Valley and you know do all the stuff that I've done. And and so what Brian shows me is that well maybe there is a chance that. I could kind of go back at this and take all these, uh, all this experience that I've got, this new understanding of how to study and solve problems and apply it to the, the work and the ideas I originally had and finally submit this body of work and get that doctorate. Yeah, who am I kidding? I'm never going to have time for that stuff. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe. Mm -hmm.